and welcome back to another episode of Life Changing Challengers. And I am so grateful and honored today to have Daniel Packard on the podcast today. Hi, Daniel. How you doing? I am ready. I'm ready to, to change some mother effing lives, Brad. Yeah. What do you think about that? I'm bringing it. So Daniel is a UC Berkeley mechanical engineer. He calls himself an inner engineer. He also is, this is a very interesting title, and this is where this episode is going to go. He's an anxiety solution pioneer. He has actually come up with a system to help people rid themselves of anxiety of fear. I mean, gone. Without drugs, the whole bit, he's got this reset. But we're going to get into that a little bit later because, of course, as we always start out here at Life Changing Challengers, Daniel, can you tell us a little bit how you grew up, the complement of your family, where you grew up, and what your environment was like growing up? I absolutely will because it, it's important. One, because what you just shared with your audience, they're not going to believe. And so telling where I grew up and I don't know what they call it, the origin story of where this all came from. But I also just want to be real clear with your audience. We are going to be covering anxiety, but really it's anxiety and fear. And really, if you, because some people will say, well, I'm not anxious. It, if you have fear or any pattern in your life where f- is a part of it. And some of the behaviors that you're working on, you don't know this or you may know this, but it's actually a symptom of fear. So if you don't have anxiety, but let's, if you're a perfectionist, if you're an overthinker, if you're a procrastinator, if you're a people pleaser, if you care what people think of you, insecure, doubt, any of those bad boys and or anxiety, I'm going to explain a way for you to understand how, as Brad said, to be free of this. No more managing. That's amateur hour. We're get, how you can be free of these things permanently. So I just want to be clear of what this is all about because it's an innovative way of doing things and your audience isn't used to that. They're used to managing these things. So with that said, my, my big, now I'll explain, what was it? My family and where I'm from? Yeah, where, when, your compliment of your family and what your childhood was like when you grew up. Well, I grew up in Berkeley, California and... I didn't know how nice it was because just it was where I grew up, but I grew up in the Berkeley Hills. I had a view of the Golden Gate Bridge from my window, and I remember bringing a girlfriend home to visit my parents, and she was driving up the hill to my house, and she went, you grew up here? This is incredible. I thought, oh, it is. It's really pretty. It's really nice. We weren't, my dad was a professor. He was a physicist, so we were middle, upper middle class, but we were surrounded by rich people because my parents bought their house early. And then it skyrocketed. So we were surrounded. And also my parents were very frugal. So everyone around us had BMWs and Audis. And, and we had a 1969 Valiant because they don't break down. And my and it just ran forever. And it was good. I liked it. My parents were also smart. Where they bought their house, we lived in the hills. So we had a view, but we weren't so high up. And they told me, they said, if we were too high up, then we'd have to drive you everywhere. And we didn't want to drive you everywhere. So if we lived halfway up the hills... Then you could get places with your bike. And they were right. I grew up, right, with my BMX and then a mountain bike, just driving around, and it was a beautiful place to live. And my dad loved sailing, so I got to sail on San Francisco Bay whenever I wanted. So logistically, it was a good childhood, nice place. My parents were very good at providing logistically warm meal, roof over the house, camp in the summer. Like logistically, gold stars five-star review on Yelp for my parents. But my dad, being a scientist, they're very strong in the mind, but yeah, not so much in the heart. So I grew up in a not mean or scary household, but a confusing household because I was a sensitive kid in a house where feelings didn't exist. And uh, I'm sure I'm not alone, but yeah, it'll confuse a little child, especially a little Daniel. That's interesting. Yeah, I I can imagine that there so it wasn't really touchy-feely. Not even, I mean, yeah, again, no. I mean, they were kind. They were polite, but I never got the I, I love you, I'm proud of you ever. I mean, maybe one would have trickled in, but I don't recall ever getting an I'm proud of you or, and I love you. And it, to the point where it started, I thought I was one of these kids that excelled at a lot of things. And so everyone else, what else would say, like, great job, Daniel. I get these awards. And, and I would go home and just nothing, just crickets and after a while i'm thinking like most kids our parents do the best we, they can but some form of love and safety goes missing 
And I started to think like, you know, does my dad even love me? Like, I don't, he's never said it. So I decided I, I came up with a plan, which was to do something that I knew he'd be proud of. And then he'd say, I'm proud of you. And like, I would know he'd love me. And that would be that. So my parents were very into me getting into college. And so college applications were a big deal. And I said, okay, this was my plan. I said, I'm going to run for class president. I'll win class president. That'll look great on a college application. I'll tell my dad. He'll say, good job. I'll know he loves me. No reason for a therapist ever again. So I, I ran for class president. I won. And I'm walking home all proud that I'd won. And then I'm going to tell my dad I'm class president. He's going to say, good job. And like, I'm going to know he loves me. And I walk in and he's standing there and I walk in all excited and I just look at him with all this excitement, enthusiasm of a kid. And I just say, hey, guess who's class president? And he said, well, don't let it interfere with your homework. Oh. And I was like, come on, dude. I was like a softball pitch. He just had to say good job. Like, no. <laughs> and I felt the pain of that moment. I mean, it was really, it scared me because I was like, this is not according to script. And this was not complicated, and it really, frankly, terrified me and, and hurt, as you can imagine. And in a last ditch of youthful, painful vulnerability, I just started crying. I really felt the pain, and I was crying. And I just looked at him and just looked at him, and I said, why, why can't you ever just say you're proud of me? And he says, it's not my job to tell you when I'm proud of you. It's my job to tell you when you mess up. And I went... I, like, I didn't get what was going on. It was so confusing and hurtful. I short-circuited. But intuitively, I was like, A, I'm pretty sure that's not great parenting. And B, you could do both. So anyway, all I knew was a very scary, painful situation. Like many of us now, as I get older, I look back. My dad's limited. He can't, Like, he can't. He's too wounded. And he couldn't in that moment. But at that age, I didn't know he couldn't. I, so what did I do? I did what all kids do. I'm like, okay, so why is this happening? I didn't know I didn't know to hold him accountable. So what do I do? I blame myself. And I make up the belief that I'm not good enough. And that is what led to a lot of the problems in my life. But it's also the pain that led to me understanding uh, how to allow other people to be free of this. So I will not give my dad uh, gold stars on emotional high fives and celebration, but I am grateful to him because as we all know, it is that pain that brings us to awareness. And that's what I'm helping people do now is, is heal from some of those wounds that get formed in childhood. We all know that you don't need me to tell you like, Hey, did you know that what you're struggling with happened a long time ago? However, what we've developed is a system so that you can heal that instead of like trying different things for years to just manage these symptoms, it's a system such that it, it's just you're free of it in a few weeks. That's the value of what we did. And before we start delving into that, because I have to step, I got to, we, we need to step back a little bit further because we need to let Daniel's inner child brag a little bit because you passed over the, oh, I used to get awards and I did this and I got all these awards and we missed all that. I need to go back and hear some of them. What were we talking about? What did you do in high school? Was it sports? Was it mathletes? Was it chess? I mean, what awards were you getting? You talked about it. You just glanced over it. I'm like, come on. <laughs> don't, don't keep us in suspense like that. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, well, let's see. What were some awards? All right. Well, one was I was in Boy Scouts and there were, in our troop, there were these special awards just for our thing. And usually you would go for one of the awards. There was two awards. And if you wanted to win one, you really had to focus on one because just for reasons I won't bore your audience, you really, you would go for either one award or the other award. And I was like, I'm going for both. I'm going to be the Michael Phelps of this mofo. Yeah. And nobody had ever done it before because it was really tough to do. And I not only won one award that had to do with my camping abilities, but then there was leadership abilities. And I won both awards, which won two awards, two had never been done in the history of our troop. That was cool. Class president yeah. in multiple years in a school of 3,000. And what other awards did I get? This wasn't an award, but cool. Oh, well, <laughs> these were, so I later found out I have a, a talent for looking at a system and finding the efficient way in, the hack. It's both brilliant, but also based in laziness. And so in my high school, we didn't compete against other high schools. We competed between the other grades. So 
there was once a year during homecoming that I was a junior and we were running a, a we, we were in competition with the seniors, but the seniors would always win because they had more resources and they were older, but I, they, you know, they were going up against the Danimal. So again, there were these five competitions and I, and you never won all five because it was impossible, but I figured out how to win. I think four out of five, and some of the reasons I'm proud of one was there was a canned food drive to, to see who could raise the most food for charity. And we were behind by, I think like 150 pounds. So I sent one of my people on my team to a, a bulk food and basically bought a hundred pounds of dried beans to put us over the top and we won. Yeah, not, I mean, not my best work, but we won. Another one was, so there would be a cheer and it was to see who could have the loudest cheer, like the best cheer. You got like thousands of kids at an auditorium. It was to see who could get the loudest and the best cheer. So I, from watching every year, I noticed that there were good cheers but when you've got 3,000 people in an auditorium, if it's because of the echo, if the cheer is really good, but like too long, it just sounds like, like on a t-shirt, it looks great, but you get a thousand kids doing it in an echo chamber. It doesn't sound so good. So I thought, forget the cheer sounding good. Let's just make it simple. So we were the class of 91. So 500, all we had to say was 90 and then one. So you got... A thousand kids going 90 and then one, 90, one. And the idea was to go from quiet to loud. So it just was 90, one, 90, one, 90, one, one. But it built this like cacophony of just like sound and noise and intensity. And we won. And I was always proud of that. So was there just, was there specific extracurriculars that you were involved in? Or was it like, obviously it was a uh, student council because you became class president. So obviously you were in student council. Was there anything else that you were, that was an extra clear that you were involved with? They were, I'm not so proud of them, but they were all based in like maximizing lifestyle with the least amount of work. And that's one of them was I found out, so I hated Spanish, going to Spanish, because it was the one thing that just being smart couldn't get you out of. You had to memorize all these words. And my Spanish teacher was just psychotic. So I hated Spanish. But I learned if you're on the cross country team, there the meets you you could skip last period because you had to make it to the other school in time. So I found out that I was born with pretty good cardio, and so essentially, if I didn't pra if I didn't go to training at all, I was just good enough to be the eighth man on varsity, and I got to skip Spanish class. So it wasn't an award; it was just like oh. figuring out how to like avoid Spanish with the gifts of I was given. So probably had I applied myself, I'd probably have a running award. But my award was the skipping eighth grade Spanish with the least amount of work award, which I gave to myself. Okay. <laughs> and now you're yeah, now you're getting in deep because you know that I'm an endurance coach. And I actually coach cross country for Tampa Catholic High School here in Tampa, Florida. So uh, yeah, you're, you, yeah, you're starting to hit that one a little bit on the head right there. So it's, yeah. So obviously if you've got that type of cardio and you had it, yeah, if you would have applied yourself, you would have been amazing. But you found other ways to be amazing. All right. So yeah, and I also want to say I'm sorry. I did desecrate your wonderful art. Your, it, it wasn't for me. I was not motivated by my love of running. I hated every minute of, of it. It was purely Spanish motivated. But I, I saw why people love cross country. I appreciate the people that did dedicate themselves to it. And I'm sorry that I dis hijacked your sport for, for nefarious reasons. No, it's, I mean, it's fine. I, I definitely have people on my team that unfortunately they're there for other reasons. They do the work just because I'm just a lovable guy. And so they do it for me, but yeah, I completely understand. So, all right. So you win class president, you win the chair award. Now you're out of high school. You go into, you go to UC Berkeley, which obviously, did you live at home while you were at Berkeley? No, thank goodness. My parents Good. were kind enough to not make that. And no, it was fun. I lived in this co-op with a bunch of kids, and yeah, it was neat. I loved it. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. But I was in engineering school. Somehow I got in. You needed really good math grades, and I didn't have the math score. Somehow I got UC Berkeley science. It's very hard to get into because it's the toughest. It's the most competitive science school in the world because it's the only American science school that's more affordable. Caltech, Harvard, MIT. Stanford, they're up there in terms of their eliteness, but they're all private. UC right. Berkeley is a public school, so it's more affordable. So you have the smartest kids from China and the smartest kids from India competing 
to get in there. So think about that. The smartest of the smart of 2 billion populations. And those kids, they're not messing around. They're not there to party, meet girls, do anything. They are there to get grades, be successful, and send money home. So I was outclassed. So somehow I got in and passed. But, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it, it was intense. Well, I so how did you do that? Did you have to take like entrance exam or something? I you apply. I think the extracurriculars, class president, things like that. I asked my dad if he helped get me in, and he claims no. And I've looked it up. He can't in public schools. You don't have that kind of pull. So I don't know how. I still don't know how I got in, but I got in. But the and I learned the beauty. The value of it was I learned a skill that I had that I didn't know I had, which was the UC Berkeley engineering school they're mostly teaching you theory you're not really building a lot of stuff and i liked m making things growing up my dad had a workshop and he let me make things and invent things i wanted to be an inventor but in engineering school you learn the theory of how to make things but you didn't really make a lot of stuff but we had this opportunity where we were supposed to design this robotic arm that was supposed to do something so i designed it but all these kids in engineering school were incredible at math it was like their second language and i wasn't really all that good at math because i didn't apply myself you can tell from my lack of with cross country. I was always just trying to find the sneaky way out. So I learned to solve things intuitively. When every other kid had an equation to solve where's the bridge going to break, I would like become the bridge. I would like feel what it was like to be a bridge. And I would say, where would I break? And I would start solving things intuitively. I would build things with intuition, which was really just a coping mechanism because I didn't have the math to do it. But it turned into kind of a cool skill because... Math is fine if it gets you the answer that the equation will get you. But what if you don't know? What if you have to innovate something? Then the math doesn't help you. So I remember one time I invented this arm, this robot arm, and I just did it on intuition. So this very successful, very famous mechanical engineer, my, my teacher, looked at it and he said, this won't work. And I said, what do you mean it won't work? He says, that won't work. It won't hold the object. It's going to break. He says, why do you think it'll work? Now, every every other kid used math, so he was expecting a mathematical, and I was like, and I just said, I don't know, man, like, I just feel like it's going to work. He said, it's not going to work, and he pulls out his pen, and he shows the math of why, with the coefficient of friction and the leverage, it wouldn't work. He said, this won't work, and I said, I don't know, man, I think it'll work, and he said, look, you go build this thing. If it works, I'll give you a job in my lab, and I said, deal, and I went, and, and what was odd is I believed myself. And I went and I built it, and it worked. What? Yeah. Now, looking back, an 18-year-old kid with pimples, pretty insecure, telling a famous teacher, hey, you're wrong, and I'm right, based on my gut feeling. And the reason it was so powerful is it ta taught me two things that led to the developing this system for people, which is that, A, I just have this ability to sometimes see solutions that, quote-unquote, the experts miss based on intuition and understanding things. But also it taught me experts can be wrong. It doesn't mean they don't know things, but like they can be wrong. And that's why I think what led to me doing what I did, I was somebody that just like your audience, well, I had, I don't know your audience, but I know they struggle. I had, I had anxiety. I had fear of rejection, insecurity, perfectionism, people pleasing, overthinking, all the greatest hits. And I went like your audience, when they see that they're struggling and not being the person they want to be, I was like, okay, let's go, let's go be a better person. So I did what your audience did. I went looking for help, and I went to the therapists and psychologists and read the books and watched the videos and did the retreats and followed the gurus, and I did it all. I did EMDR and EFT and IFS and CGT and EFT and MOUSE. I, I did, like, I did it all, Brad. I did everything, $100,000, 10 years, and I more or less was still doing all the same stuff. I had some insights. I had some tips and tools to manage it. But it wasn't gone. And the engineer in me that is trained to get results and do things that work, I was like, this industry, I call it the improvement industrial complex, personal development, therapy, psychology, spirituality. I was like, they, this, they don't get great results. 10 years, 100 grand, and it's not gone. That's a horrible track record. If I took my car to a mechanic and $100,000 and 10 years later, it still had engine trouble, that's a bad mechanic. 
but I spent all this money and stuff and when this industry it doesn't get great results but nobody has a problem with it and I just saw I was in all this pain and still doing my same stuff that was keeping me from being the person I wanted to be and living the life I wanted to live and I guess in that experience with my teacher and my own pain and wanting to be free of this stuff, I said, maybe we, maybe I could reverse engineer something that we could be free of. Maybe the experts have missed something. So I started my own research company to see if we could reverse engineer an understanding of human struggle that would allow us to be free of it. Meaning it's gone, not in years and lifetimes, but in weeks. And I didn't know if it was possible. I just tried and it took years it took we worked with 3,000 people spent over a million dollars in research and development I was one of the first test cases to get the results and I remember just waking up one morning at, after using all these tools that we've been developing and I just w remember waking up one morning feeling oddly calm and I thought well this has got to be temporary there's no way this is gonna last but it one day goes by, one week goes by, just calm. Nothing. No anxiety, no fear, nothing. Just gone. It's been 10 years. I've been chill as a cucumber. Nothing. I feel some stress sometimes for maybe two or three minutes, and that's about it. But then also, I stopped caring what people think of me. The, ins the insecurity went away. The procrastination went away. The doubt went away. The perfectionism, the it, just, it was just, just gone. And when my team saw this, they said, Daniel, we did it. Like, we figured it out. And I said, no, for me, yeah, great, I'm free of it. I mean, that's nice. I'm joyful, I'm content, I don't care what people think of me, but the goal wasn't about me. The goal was to see could we develop something for the world. So it took another five years to take the theory that worked for me and systematize it. That, was, that took more hard work, it was to create a system, a simple step-by-step -step system. It's all online, videos and exercises and diagrams such that anybody, no matter what they struggle with, anxiety, perfectionism, overthinking, self-doubt, whatever it is, in six weeks, if you follow the steps, you get the result, which is that it's gone and not coming back. And we have a 90% success rate. And because our passion is results, as you go through the program, we're tracking your results numerically. So we have real data on how you're improving. And if your symptom isn't gone at the end of six weeks, we don't charge you. We don't charge. We don't. When you work with us, you don't pay at the beginning because we haven't helped you yet. I'm, I'm an engineer. We haven't gotten you a result. We only charge you at the end of the six week program when what you're struggling is gone. That's when you pay. And I, that's just because I'm an engineer and results matter. And if we can't help you, but also it's just wrong. It's just wrong to take people's money. I believe if you can't solve their problem, don't take their money. That's me. Other people will. But it doesn't feel right. I I agree with that. And when I start a new client for endurance sports, and I guess like I'd mentioned to you before, I coach endurance sports, and I I have I've had thousands of people come to me, and I always tell them, hey, our first session, so that we're going to meet, you have a consultation, and then we'll have a first session. And after that first session, if you're not comfortable, if you don't feel like I can, I am the right coach for you. If we don't fit, no charge, right? We'll charge, we'll talk about what the price is afterwards, but we want to make sure that there's a fit there first. Right. And, and then usually, so I'm the same way. I feel the exact same way. I don't want anybody getting services from me unless they really feel like I can help them. So that also takes me into account and says, all right, that first session I'm with them, got to, I've got to be my best. I, I've got to give them everything they can and I have to do it for them. Right for them, for themselves. So I get it and I'm a hundred percent out for it. And I, and I applaud you because I think that's amazing that you actually get people through the program before you even think about saying, Oh, okay, we helped you. Great. Okay. Now we're going to charge you. And if you didn't, if you're not, then thank you. Thank you. And, and I charge. appreciate you doing it. And it's, well, it's still ethical and the right thing to do. And I appreciate it about you. It's done in places where results are pretty guaranteed. If you're working with someone in training and coaching, this is stuff that's measurable. You can it, it's not a mystery. So you can back up your results. If you're if you're a personal trainer, you can get a person stronger. You I mean this stuff works. The mechanics of how to do what you do is tested and measurable and works. It's just nobody ever thought to do it with like the inner world to actually train like an athlete and we I've worked with several athletes and the reason they like what we do 
is because they know how to train their bodies. They just didn't know how to train their inner world. And so our entire structure is set up like an, a gym where there's reps and we call it instead of daily uh, cardio, we call it daily cardio. And they, I uh, worked with a, a former NFL athlete. He, of course, knows discipline and he was able to apply our tools such that the one thing he couldn't work in a real gym, which was the pressure. When under pressure, he would crack. Also, I worked with a golfer, helped her so that when, in tough moments, the pressure didn't get to her and she could perform at a high level. So we work with a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot of athletes. We work with athletes for two reasons. One is we get incredible results in these two areas that they don't, they're not able to solve, which is under an, an extremely stressful moments or when you're, you're not performing well, can you stay centered? But also our program is very disciplined. And so athletes love what we do because they just work the steps and they get the results. Awesome. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So what are some of the components of the reset? Well, the reason, first of all, I'll, well, there's a lot of answers to this. When I tell people that we have a system that allows them to be free of what holds them back, logically they like the idea, but intuitively, if you're paying attention, you should be highly skeptical. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you should be skeptical. That's not cynical. Everything. I mean, everything on the market is, and I'm not saying it doesn't help. I'm just saying it doesn't solve anything. Even meditation, mindfulness, mindset, it's managing the symptoms. It'll help you in the moment, but it'll come back. And I'm not saying there's no value to that. I'm just saying it's a limited model. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just be free of this? If you break a leg and you have two options, you can do a meditation every day to lower your leg pain, or you can just put it in a cast and in eight weeks your leg is healed. What do you want to go through? You don't do the meditation. I'm not dismissing what's out there. I'm just saying it doesn't allow you to be free of it, let alone in six weeks. So when I tell people we can do this, they go, there's no way you can do that. And their experience says that. So I'll explain to you why it's more possible because otherwise your audience won't believe me. And if they don't believe me, they won't reach out for help. So here, well, first of all, let me tell you there's precedent for this. The reason we were able to find a solution is because we were looking for a solution. Therapists, psychologists, uh, personal development coaches, gurus, for the most part, for the most part, they learn tips and tools and techniques that give you insights and awareness to manage things. And then they sell it to you and they make some money. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you look at what they really do, it's the same old stuff that really gives you awareness and understanding and manages, but they don't solve it. And that's okay. But they're not really passionate about solving it. They just regurgitate the same stuff. They're not trying to innovate. Innovation's hard. It took eight years. From a, it's hard, but I'm an engineer and I'm an innovator and I just could not tolerate management. So part of the reason that we solved it is because we wanted to solve it. And that's not everybody. Not everyone's an innovator. And part of the reason I thought it was possible is because my mom told me growing up this story of Florence Nightingale. I don't know if you know the story, but basically Florence Nightingale is this British nurse in the 1850s. And she saw that more soldiers were dying in recovery than in battle. So she goes to the experts, the doctors and the generals, and she says, like, hey, we got a lot of men dying here. That's my incredibly accurate Florence Nightingale impression. And the generals and the doctors just basically said, like, don't worry about it. It's just part of war. Like, there's nothing you can do. That's the experts. But the experts, the problem with experts is they're in their old ways. They just regurgitate old beliefs. But she wasn't an expert. She's just a nurse who cared and was paying attention. And she saw this correlation between infection rate and hygiene. And she was the one who said, hey, why don't we open the windows, clean the bandages, don't put open wounds near the toilets. Surprise, surprise, the death rate dropped by 99%. She discovered it not because she was smarter. She discovered it because she was an outsider who wasn't an expert and wanted to solve it. And we were the same. We're not therapists. We're not psychologists. We're not. Th People say, you're not a mental health expert. I'm like, I know. That's why. The mental health expert, look at their track record. Anxiety's on the rise. So their data, their results, not great. You want someone who's not that. So we wanted to solve it. And that's part of why we solved it. We also solved it because our approach, it, we did what worked. And we did what worked because we looked at what wasn't working. And then we looked at what does work. And what does work is everywhere. And what does this mean? So we look at therapy, psychology, spirituality, 
and we looked at what are most people doing. Most people are using individual tools and techniques or awarenesses from individual coaches. Like one coach will teach mindset, one therapist will teach trauma, one person will teach you about mindfulness, or you generally are like going, you're reading one book on the power of now, one book on this, one book on that. Now that's okay if you want to learn about something, gain awareness and manage something. One tool or technique at a time. But if you want to really bring something back to health, like truly overhaul something, you can't do it with one tool or technique. You need a complete toolkit that's engineered to work together to get the job done. Okay? Like if you don't take care of your teeth and you just want to manage the pain, you can floss a little bit. But if you need a root canal and you go to the dentist, do they have one tool? Like do they hand you floss? Or do they have multiple tools? Exactly, multiple. Yeah. And is it random tools? Like, do they have a hammer and a chainsaw? Is it a bunch of random tools? Or is it a specific toolkit designed to work together to get the job done? Absolutely the latter. Yeah. Now, it makes sense when you hear it, right? If you hire a contractor to come to your house and he just has a hammer, he's like, you need a hammer. I got a hammer. And he just has like 30 hammers. Aren't you going to wonder whether this guy can actually, like, rebuild your house? Yeah, exactly. I saw one with that. Well, th with only one type of tool, right? Yeah. There's so many different things that need to be done. How do you saw? How do you do electrical work with a hammer? How do you do plumbing with a hammer? Right. Yeah. So you need multiple tools and multiple tools that work together that are optimized to get the job done. That's just if you're a mechanic, a contractor, a dentist, a doctor— that's what does things quickly. So that's what gets the job done. But is it fair to say that when people, your audience and you has gone looking for help for whatever, you usually would go to one expert for like one or two tools or techniques at a time? Oh, you're hundred percent right. And I've actually, I've actually let people go off my roster because I have a certain methodology and I give them some my tools. And sometimes it gets to a point where their progress is stagnated. So I literally say, all right, you're, I'm no longer going to coach you. I have another coach that I would like you to go to for a while. And they go there, and then they get another set of tools. So now they've got more than one set of tools, another two sets of methodologies that they can go back to in order to progress to the goal, right? Marinda Carfrey is a three-time Ironman world champion, right? And she's amazing. And But she was under the same coach for a long time, Sari Lindley who is also a like world-class triathlon coach. And Siri sent her to Australia, well, she was from Australia, to Brett Sutton for two seasons. And Brett took a totally different approach with her and gave her more tools. Then she decided to go back to Siri, and now she has multiple tools, right? So at her disposal, and she won again. So... Yeah, I 100% believe in, in having more tools in your toolbox. So at least when you were, or this story, she was aware that she didn't have all the tools and you're in integrity and, and the coach will say, look, I know what I'm good at, I know what I'm not good at. Right. Now, fortunately, she went and got it. The thing is, yes, it's better to have more tools in your toolkit, but the problem is for things like anxiety, overthinking, perfectionism, Usually, they're not. Usually, the teacher, or the coach doesn't say, by the way, this is just one tool. This will never get the job done. They're not honest about that. They're like, I'm a mindset coach. I'm going to help you with mindset. Nothing wrong with mindset, but it's that they don't, they're not, it's really not about what other people are doing. But even if you go around and get one tool and one tool and one tool, it's very inefficient. It takes years and years and years if you're lucky. I've met a person who solved his anxiety permanently. And I asked him how long it took, and he said 14 years because he was going from tool to tool to tool. So it's possible through trial and error and brute force, but in that eight years, we built a complete toolkit and optimized it so everything's in one place, and that's partly why it takes six weeks. So I'm telling you this why so you understand why this is possible too. You were not given a complete toolkit for your insecurity, your anxiety, your overthinking, your perfectionism. And that's why you failed. And I'm telling your audience this because if you don't know, you end up blaming yourself and you think you're broken and there's something wrong with you and you're trapped. That's how I felt. And I'm here to tell you, this is not your fault. It's that the experts that you trusted had an incomplete understanding of what they were doing and didn't tell you. 
and that's why you failed. When you have a complete toolkit to get the job done, and those tools have been optimized to work together to get the job done, I hope you can understand the likelihood of you solving something skyrockets when you have all the tools in one place. Right. So can you give us a brief or give us a brief outline of what those tools are? Well, I think it's more important. The reason I say no is because even the reason the program is effective is not the tools. The reason the program is effective is because of a collection of tools. And if I pull one tool out, your audience will go, oh, that's interesting. But that won't really help them. It's just not helpful. And what I'm trying to do is change people's paradigms about what's possible and for them to understand why they failed so that they don't blame themselves and feel trapped. It gives them hope that you could be free of this. So what I will say is it's not just the tools that gets the results, because even if you have all the tools, that's still not enough to solve something quickly. So let's say, for instance, I don't know, you had a friend who tasted a chocolate chip cookie. And your friend said, wow, I want to make chocolate chip cookies. And they knew nothing about baking. Now, first of all, if you just hand them one aspect of baking, if you just hand them flour or just a bowl, are they going to succeed in or fail at making a chocolate chip co cookie? Oh, they're going to fail. Yeah, because you need to complete all the ingredients and all the tools. So they're going to fail. But if this person knew nothing about baking, and you did, you handed them all the ingredients and all the things they needed, but they didn't know anything about baking, would they succeed or fail? They would fail. Yeah, why? What's missing? The technique. Yeah, the instructions. Right. Like, That's what do you do in what order and when? Right. When you're working with people, am I right? Isn't there an order? You start here, oh. then you move them here? Absolutely. 100%. Right. And isn't there an amount? Like, okay, do reps of this, and there's... A, right. So there's an order... There's a sequence and a timing. You see this everywhere, especially in physical training. But again, when people go trying to work on anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, mindset, overthinking, whatever it is, even if usually the coach or the therapist or the book basically says, hey, here's a technique. Good luck. And you're on your own. And like, you're going to fail. I remember reading The Power of Now and, and Eckhart Tolle is like, be in the now. It's better. And I'm like, ooh. He's right. Being that out, it's better. And I tried it. No instructions, no explanation of what to do and when. I tried it and I failed. Not only was it, did I fail, but I blamed myself. So in, in the years that we developed a system, it's not just the tools. You need the instructions. You need an explanation. What do you do in what order for how many reps for how long? If you don't know that, you'll fail. If you don't know how to bake, you're like, what do I do with the flour? Do I put it in the oven? What do I do with the egg? Do I just hold it? If I put it in the oven, what do I do? How long in the oven? If you don't have the instructions, you will fail. People are given better instructions on how to make a Lego castle and an Ikea bookshelf than they are in how to actually be free of what's holding them back. So this is why your audience has failed. They got an incomplete toolkit. And they weren't given clear instructions on what to do, in what order, and when. And also the reason they failed is because you know this. If you give your client something that's beyond their capacity, it's too much for them, they're going to fail. Right? right? Let's say you're a strength conditioning coach and the person is new. If it, and they try to lift 1,000 pounds, they're going to fail and can even hurt themselves. But again, when it comes to personal development, spirituality, and therapy, they just say, here you go. I remember following a guru for like six months. He said, your ego is the problem. Get rid of the ego. That's like a, a thousand pound. Weight. You can't get rid of the ego. Like what? Or when I had a coach one time, a mindset coach. He said, you need to shift your mindset to believe in yourself. And I was like, oh, okay. But like that's, you can't just do that. You got to work up to that. So that's why people try this stuff and fail and then beat themselves up. No. We have a complete toolkit with instructions where you start off really simple and gentle. You build up some strength and skill and mastery, and then you move on to the next sequence. And we do this because we don't want you to fail. And I'm telling your audience this because part of the reason more people don't work with us is because they don't know what we have is better. They know what they've tried. And they've tried things and they've failed. Not only have they failed, but they fail and they feel even more trapped. 
and even more broken and even more like something wrong with me. So the people that work with us are two groups. One of the groups is the people that just think it's all their fault and they think that they're going to try one more thing and fail. And I'm telling your audience, if you have a fear of that, I totally get it. And really almost anything else out there, yes, if you try it, you will fail to be free of it and it's no fun. When we built our pro- – I know the pain of trying things and failing and feeling more broken. And when we built this program, the reason we have a 90% success rate is because I said when we build this, this has to be so dead simple that if somebody shows up every day, it's going to work. We want you to succeed so that you're free of this and live the life you want to live. But also we do not want you to fail because we do not want you to feel that pain and feel worse about yourself. We're here to help you feel better, not worse. But also the reason we get paid at the end is so that you know your success and our success are linked. We're in this together. We're not going to take your money and leave you on your own, which is what a lot of the coaches did to me. It took a lot of my money and gave me some tips and tools and left me to hang. And we're not going to do that to you. So if you're worried about trying something and failing, I get it. But we really built this to honor people. People are in pain. They need something that just effing works. Partly so it works, but also we don't want you to fail. That's that's a really powerful statement. If you literally hear what Daniel said, he says, he says, do not want you to fail. And this is a six-week program that will take away your anxiety and your fears. So with that being said, is even with like, so I work with a lot of with some cancer institutions and even having cancer and they go into remission, there's maintenance that needs to be done in order to keep it there. Is there any type of maintenance after the six weeks to make sure that we remain in that, in that state of no anxiety and fear? Or is at, are you saying that at the six weeks, it's just gone? That's an excellent question, and it relates to what you do. So the short answer is part of the other reason, the breakthrough that made all this possible, is we saw that, first of all, the root cause of what everybody is struggling with is just one root cause. It's fear. You can call it anxiety, but you're really just terrified. It's fear. And then you you call that extra scary feeling anxiety. But mechanically, it's fear. But also procrastination. You can call it procrastination, but if you actually look at it mechanically, really, there's something you're afraid to finish, and then you're afraid someone's going to judge you or not like it, brings up the fear of rejection. So it's fear. The procrastination is a strategy to avoid that fear. Make sense? Absolutely. Perfectionist. Oh, I'm a perfectionist. You're not a perfectionist. You're afraid to make a mistake and be judged, so you want it to be perfect. You're not a perfectionist. It's a coping mechanism to avoid fear. So mechanically, all these struggles, you don't have different problems. You are afraid and you have different experiences. So our program is healing the fear. And when you heal the fear, the symptom, whether it's anxiety, perfectionism, overthinking, is gone. Make sense? Yes. And that fear, we found out the location, the actual mechanical location is not where we're taught these problems are coming from. We're trained that most of our problems are coming from the mind. Change your mindset. Anxiety is a problem of the mind. It's called mental health. It's got the word mental right in there. The ego, which is the mind. Perfectionism, overly critical. It's all we're taught now. If that got results, fine. But it doesn't. How do we know? People are stuck with this their whole life. The mind is part of it. But the mind is a symptom of what's actually causing the fear, which is your body. The fear is coming from your body. Wow. Okay. That's, ooh, that's interesting. Okay. Can you give me an example? I can not only give you an example, this just makes common sense. Have you ever noticed that when you feel calmer, your mind tends to notice more good things and have positive thoughts yes absolutely yeah and when you feel more anxious or scared your mind tends to go to negative town faster yeah you gotta i think we have to the vocabulary is like stress and like fear like i can be totally like physically stressed via physical activity and my mind doesn't go there but if I'm stressed 
via an outside stimulus. And yeah, I definitely, my mind will go to, when I go to the dark, dark place and I start having negative self-talk. So yeah. Yeah. And where do we feel that fear? Whatever you call it. You feel it in your throat, your chest, your heart, your stomach. Yeah. Okay. So the experts are telling you it's mental health. Change your mindset. It's your ego in the mind. Quiet the mind. Mind. But listen to those words. Chest, throat, heart, stomach. Does that sound like the mind to you or more like the body? It's the body. We are wired such that the body sends signals of what the body needs to stay alive. And then the mind is a tool to get the body what it needs. You feel hunger in your body first, and then your mind goes, oh, I sense the hunger. We should figure out where to go eat. That's true. Yeah. We're wired such that if you're in the jungle and you hear a noise, and you, you will feel fear in the body first. And then your mind is a tool to say, we better get the hell out of here. It's a tool. The mind is a tool to get the body what it needs. So now, for reasons which... Our program addresses your body, keyword, your body is feeling fear. Then your mind senses that fear, thinks there's a problem, and then starts creating problems trying to solve the imaginary problem. Now, if you don't know this, you think it's the mind, partly because the mind says critical things and scary things, and then you feel fear. So you think, oh, it's the mind. And you've got all these experts telling you it's the mind. But if you look closely, it's not... The mind is not the root cause. The mind is a symptom of what's really causing this, which is the body. It starts in the body and it spreads to the mind. How do we know this? Because this is not theory. When we started developing tools that just focused on the body, not only did the fear in the body go down and stay down, that let us know we're in the root cause, but then the mind went quiet with it. I used that not only have anxiety, but my mind was not only critical, it was like screaming at me. It was like the, ju the judges from the Muppets. And when my body calmed down, my mind has been quiet for 10 years. It, it just doesn't talk anymore. It's gone. I don't need to meditate. I don't need to change my mindset. It's just quiet. And when it does talk, it says nice things. So the reason your audience has failed is because they were sent to the literal wrong location, the mind. The mind is a symptom. It's part of it. It's just not the root cause. So if you spend decades focusing on a symptom, that's why it hasn't gone away. Not because you're broken. Not because there's anything wrong with you. It's because the experts literally sent you to the wrong location. I hope you can understand that if you go to the right location, you have a heck of a lot better chance of solving something. Well, and that's super interesting that you say that because like my audience, well, so my audience is not just endurance athletes. It's everybody. But as far as my clients go and the people that listen that are in endurance athletes or just athletes, there is that section of, hey, you know what? When we do feel stress or something and then we go out and we do something like me, go out for a run and all of a sudden you get what we call the runner's high, which is the endorphins coming in. Well, what we were thought, what I thought is like you're going. So, yeah. And no matter what's going on in your what's going on. You can manage it, not like what your what your program does, but we manage it because we go out for a run and we're doing something with our body that's creating some endorphins for our mind. So now it totally makes sense. Absolutely. People, look, the stuff I'm pointing to, it works so well, not because this is fancy. It's dead simple. It's just the experts were really confused and have given people poor information. But once you start hearing what I'm saying, it makes sense. People who have anxiety, stress, overwhelm, what do they do? They've learned intuitively, go do something in the body to calm the body down. It could be exercise. It could be breath work. The body calms down and the mind follows. We have the data. That's, and that works for symptom management. We just figured out how to calm the body permanently. So now you don't have to run or do breath work to calm the body. Your body is permanently calm. My body is permanently calm. It's just, just calm. And because of that, it's permanent, and my mind is permanently quiet. But people already know it starts in the body. They already have the data. They use that to manage it, but we figured out how to solve it. That's, yeah, I mean, like a lot of that makes sense to me, but how you say that it starts in the body, that is not, and that's not clicking with me just for this, right? Somebody, somebody's got a relationship, and they go to their significant other, and all of a sudden this thing that they thought was, 
beautiful and great. And all of a sudden they get broken up with right there. Now I've had my fair share of breakups and man, the minute you hear those words, it hurts and then it gets worse and worse. So that wouldn't that be more of, okay, I've received a signal saying that I'm losing a part of myself. Then it goes to the body. So isn't, so that tells me more brain than reaction with the body. Well, here's the thing. Both happen in a blink of an eye. Once your body starts to feel something, within about a tenth of a second, your mind responds. Okay? So from your experience, they're going to happen at the same time. Okay. Okay. Now, if a bunch of experts tell you, well, this is just your mind creating a narrative that you're, and it's your mind telling you things, and then it spreads to your body, it sounds like a decent theory, right? Right. Okay. Results matter. Do those people that you went to who gave you this advice, did they help you be completely free of this? No, and I get it. I get it. It's a managing. I was looking for more like the science part of it. No, but what I'm explaining is the reason you believe this is because somebody told you that. And if you don't know what's going on, it seems like it starts in the mind and spreads to the body. A, because it happens so fast, you can't tell the difference. It's simultaneous. And the experts tell you it starts in the mind, so you think it starts in the mind. And I'm just saying that could be true if it were true, but it's not true because if it was true, these people would get better results. So you think it starts in your mind because it happens at the, at, almost at the same time, and people told you this is mind stuff, and you believe them because it makes sense, right? Oh, my mind tells me negative thoughts, and now I feel worse. One problem. That's not true. We are mechanically wired. The body feels things first, and it spreads to the mind second. But again, you can't know whether I'm telling the truth based on this. Here's how you know. Based on what I'm telling you, that it all starts in the body and spreads to the mind, I've been chill as a cucumber for 10 years. Yeah. Okay, based on that, we have a 90% success rate in six weeks. Based on that, we're the only company in the world, the only one, that charges you at the end once you're free of it. So from sitting here, you can't trust me that it starts in the body, but based on that knowledge, we're getting way better results. Yeah, and if you go to danielpacker.com, you'll actually see a lot of these like amazing testimonials that people are talking about. So it's there. He's got the, he's got the data. And again, if you, like I said, go visit uh, danielpacker.com, you actually can, he's got a, you can listen to Daniel and his. He's got a he's got a short introductory video on there, and you can book book a free call with him and figure out what you're what you can do next. If you're starting to feel or you have felt this anxiety and this fear, this is a way for you to rid yourself of that and just have the greatest life that you could possibly imagine, whether you end up into obstacles or not. Yeah, so. what. The benefit of this approach, it's hard for people to understand what real freedom is like because we spend our whole lives managing it. When you spend your whole life managing it, that's your life. So your energy goes to the management. But our program, by going to the right location, the body, which is where fear comes from, because basically if you don't treat your body right physically, like if your diet is off, you will see symptoms. Like if you eat poorly your body will show symptoms. Essentially, we saw that 19, no, 10 to 30 times a day, people are basically accidentally, unknowingly neglecting their inner emotional world. They don't know they're doing it. And so an accumulation of that neglect leaves people feeling unsafe within their own body. If a person treats you poorly, if we're friends and I treat you like crap long enough, will you feel safe or unsafe? around me unsafe right so there's a direct mechanical link between how you're treated and how safe you feel it's yeah. mechanics so in a friend relationship if i treat you poorly long enough you'll feel unsafe you feel unsafe you'll feel fear if you feel fear you'll have anxiety procrastination it'll all come but we're in a relationship with ourselves and is it fair to say that you're sometimes not always a very loving caring friend to yourself oh yeah 100 percent. yeah People know that. 
people are like, oh, I'm so hard on myself. Oh, I beat myself up all the time. People know they treat themselves poorly. People know they have fear. What we saw in the research that's so simple everybody missed is there's a direct mechanical link between that poor treatment and the feeling of fear and unsafety. That's what we discovered. Just like Florence Nightingale discovered a simple thing, we discovered a simple thing. So the downside is 10 to 30 times a day, totally unknowing to you, you're doing things that are accumulating to leaving you feeling unsafe within your own body and you don't know you're doing it. So you can't stop it. So the symptoms are always going to come because you keep redoing it to yourself. You can't lose weight if you keep eat eating cheeseburgers every day. But can you see that if the fear and unsafety in your body is a direct mechanical cause of an accumulation of you not being good to you in little ways, 10 to 30 times a day, and that's been building up like calories, and that's leaving you feeling unsafe in your own body. If it, the root cause is little behaviors accumulating over time, and that's causing the problem, can you see why that's actually good news if you want to solve this quickly? Yeah, absolutely. It's just, yeah, that, that cumulative aspect of it is so powerful. Because thinking about that, oh, wait, we've been doing this for years. So what is it, so what is it to unprogram that? Or you don't have to unprogram it. It's just like the body. Okay, if you eat more calories than you burn, a little bit each day, you gain weight. If you, right. if you gain enough weight, it's a problem. Now, when people have extra weight, they don't go, oh, my God, I'm suffering from, like, big belly disorder. Or, oh, my God, this is an effect of my childhood. Oh, my God. No, they go, oh, no, wait a minute. I made little daily choices that accumulated. And the reason that's good news is to turn it around, instead of doing little unhealthy acts, you just do little healthy acts, and the weight goes away. Our program is dead simple. Instead of doing 30 things that are unhealthy to your soul, you switch from unhealth to health, and mechanically, the, at the end, you go from unsafe to feeling safe within yourself. It's dead simple. Little behaviors done every That's what the program does. Four times a day for five minutes, you make little micro adjustments to how you treat yourself, and this is all laid out in the program. And if you work just like you can lose weight with a set of steps, you can lose the fear with a set of steps. It's doable. This isn't that weird. This isn't too good to be true. If you can lose weight, you can lose fear. That should be my bumper sticker. Yeah, I love that. That's for If you can lose weight, you can lose fear. That's amazing. Yeah, because obviously you've heard it all before with the therapist saying, oh, no, you're fat because of the way you grew up. And you're fat because your parents were fat. Blah. When you're what's staying is, no, <laughs> let's make those mechanical adjustments and make yourself feel more powerful and, and less fear. So then you can tackle the weight problem. Right. But the key is that the adjustments that need to be made are just small adjustments that accumulate. The reason people fail in trying to be happy is because they're like, oh, I have a critical mind, and they just try to, like, shut it off. That's, like, almost impossible. A, you're in the wrong place, and it's a symptom. Or I need to believe in myself. That's totally abstract. Like, what? What does that even look like? Or you need to not doubt yourself. It's this big abstract thing. But losing weight isn't abstract. You just make a couple adjustments to your diet, and you burn more calories. It's all doable steps. Right. And the reason this program works is it's based on doable steps that accumulate to get you the result. And the result is that you're free. And when you're free of it, oh my, God, it's so different. Just imagine your life. If you woke up every morning, this is for your audience, whether you have anxiety, procrastination, caring what people think of you, just imagine following a set of steps. And at the end of six weeks, the result is you wake up every morning and you feel safe and solid from within. If you felt that's your default, you just felt safe and solid from within how would your life be better you know what and that's how i'm gonna put that in that exact question in the show notes along with ways to get a hold of you and your website and because I, this is amazing people you really gotta take advantage of this because this is groundbreaking right and i think yeah this can help a lot of people tell people so one more question. Let's make this, let's round this out with a little bit more fun. So I understand that you are also a stand-up comedian. I was for 20 years, yeah. For 20 years. Did So did this come before or after or during while you're doing stand-up? 
this all came after, but the approach that I apply, the muscle or the attitude that let figuring out how to figure this out, how to basically get rid of fear in six weeks was it was hard, and you had to have a lot of vision and tenacity. And it, and I built that muscle partly in engineering school, but also as a comedian. When I was a comedian, I was I got I was good pretty quickly, and I got bored, and I thought I want to try something new, and I came up with this new way of doing comedy that had never been done before. And everybody told me it's, it wasn't possible, but I had a vision that it would be possible. And if I could pull it off, it would completely innovate comedy. And it, it and also it, it would be so good that I wouldn't have to do what all other comedians do, which is beg for stage time and maybe beg for a TV role. Like I didn't want to beg. I read the Van Gogh biography and basically he just went and just like painted and painted and painted and painted because he wasn't trying to do anything. He didn't want to become a painter. He just liked painting. But he became so good at what he did that when he dies, everybody like came to him. Now he was dead. So not a great business model. But I like the idea that you could innovate something and it'd be so good that you that people would come to you. And as a comedian, you're always a beggar. And I said, I'm going to innovate this art form and then it's going to be so valuable and so incredible that the, the gatekeepers will come to me. So I spent 10 years to innovate this style of comedy. So much hard work. And at the end, I had a one-man show that I built. 10 years to develop. Incredible. I moved to New York. And within two weeks, I had the producers of Book of Mormon and Wicked who wanted to put my one-man show on Broadway. Wow. Oh, oh, man. Did that ever come to fruition? Well... I mean, we worked on it. It was just about to happen. We worked on it for two years. And I think God or spirit or universe knew. It, I, it, it's not what I was meant to do. And I would have been trapped. And I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to figure this out. So basically a whole set of circumstances happened. The whole project crumbled in like two weeks. And I was actually relieved. But oh. the gift of it is this ability to have a 10-year vision of something and work at it and and just in your heart know it's possible. So when I went to go develop this program, I didn't know if it was going to work, Brad. But I had this experience with comedy that and this tenacity and persistence to just go at something hard, all in commitment. And that's what it took to pull this off. So and I'd much rather be helping people be free of fear and anxiety to live the life they want to live instead of telling jokes on Broadway. This is much more fulfilling and a much better Sir Lue. That said, the trainings in in the in the program are very funny. I gotta be honest. I made sure to put a lot of humor in there because I know the stuff is painful. So when you work with me, when you go through the program, it's all videos, but they're not only insightful, but I gotta say they're pretty effing funny because I was a comedian for twenty years. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, listen, let's wrap this up, Daniel. Thank you so much. I'm going to make sure that all of, we've got your website, danielpacker.com. Make sure you go visit that. Even just to listen to some of the testimonials and Daniel's thing, Daniel's intro video. And then, so I have all of your socials. Are you, which one are you more active on? I mean, with all due humility, I don't want people following me on social media because that doesn't lead to results. We're looking for motivated people. And I don't want people following my content. If you are paying attention and you heard what I said, we're, you can be free of this and you only pay at the end when it works. You should not be going and following me on social media. You should be going to my website and you should be figuring out what we do and you should book a call with me. That's what you should do. We're looking for motivated people who actually truly want to be free of this and love the fact that there's no risk and love the fact that it's a system so they can't fail. So I, my passion is freedom. And those people, please don't go to social media because then you're just learning more and understanding more. No, you've done that. Go follow other people on social media if you want to be free of this because it'll get you what you want. If you want to wake up every morning happy, if you want to wake up every morning doing what you want, love, if you want to wake up every morning with your heart open, if you want to wake up every morning so you can show up for your family and your kids and your partner. And you, if that motivates you enough then don't go to my social media. Go to danielbacker.com, find out what we're doing, find out about our No Change, No Charge guarantee, learn about the program, then book a free call with me, and let's talk. You tell me what you're struggling with, I'll show you where it's coming from, 
and I'll show you how we can solve it in six weeks. If you want to work with us, great. If not, that's okay too. We just want to work with motivated people who want to be free of this. I, I don't think I could say anything better than the way you said that. So Daniel, thank you so much. It's been an honor. It's been a privilege. And for the rest of you, we will see you in the next episode. All right. Have a good one.